Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Toby Singers. Let's get biblical Q and A. Coming to you from the Holy Land, the man himself, Rabbi Toby Singer. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you today? Oh, so good to have me back. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. Very nice. Very nice. How's your week yeah. been? It's been slammed around here. Wow. Say, how was the week? Week is nice. Oh, getting ready for Passover. Yeah, week is excellent. Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot of good things happening. Just um, meeting in person so many people whose lives are transformed by this broadcast is is important because you know we're we're in studios and we can't I can't tell from in here how many how many people are moved transformed but wow you know in the streets of Jerusalem just wow that's very exciting. I bet it is. I know from here it's the same thing. I mean, all I see is the front lens of my camera. I mean, I don't see all the people watching like with you. And then my uh, my biggest question I've been holding off on was, since you've lived in Israel and you've got so much direct contact with the people there, um, are you finding it more, uh, this, could be, this is probably a stupid question, but are you finding it a lot more helpful in doing what you do, being there at the place to protect the people from these false de- false religions and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And here it's a nightmare. Here it's much worse than any other place I'd ever seen because there's so many missionaries here and they're baked into the system. They're actually working with the government, through the government. They have all sorts of positions of working with uh, Jewish communities, integrated, baked in. Here the the cancer is really metastasized here in a very dangerous way. So there's a lot of work to do, but there's so many, so many souls are on fire for God, have done shuva, have repented, <laughs> returned back to the God of Israel. And that's meeting awesome. them, that, that's exciting. That's that really is very nice. exciting. For, it's, it seems like for once, uh, <laughs> for once Israel actually has leverage against all the missionaries moving, uh, moving down there to try to, uh, to save everybody. We've got, uh, Rabbi Singer there now to kind of yeah. put up that wall. That's yeah. good. Well, yeah, it, it, it's very important. So I'm very, very excited. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to move in right into the first question. The first question today, that we don't do this often, but I'm going to do it today, is uh, is one that was written in, uh, but I think it's a pretty decent question. It says, I understand the corruption in the New Testament and that it conflicts the text in Tanakh, but how can one be sure that the text in Tanakh are from Hashem because it is also written by people? They could have also invented stories to convince people the same way it happened in the New Testament. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interviewed frequently on atheist shows. Atheist shows. And that question comes up a lot. And I always scratch my head when I hear that question. So let's review this together for a moment. Okay. Why is the book of Matthew problematic? Why is the book of Mark problematic? So let's take Matthew. Is it problematic because the first gospel claims that the Messiah was born of a virgin and God could not cause a virgin to conceive? Is the reason why the Gospels are problematic is because God could not resurrect someone like uh, Jairus's daughter from the dead. Is the Hebrew, is the Christian Bible problematic because God or a prophet of God could not cause a, a leper to be healed. Is it problematic that in the New Testament that all four Gospels claim that the Messiah died and resurrected? Like, is, would that be difficult for God to resurrect anyone? So I think you know where I'm going with all this. The answer is, of course not. Causing a virgin to conceive would be a minor miracle in the grand scheme of things. Biologically, it would be much more difficult to cause a very old woman who has no eggs left, just 
so you know, girls are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. So that's quite an amazing feat to co cause an elderly woman to conceive. A much greater miracle than a virgin conceiving. We've never observed parthenogenesis among humans, but we have observed it in the animal world. So that's where everyone gets it all wrong. There is nothing about the Christian Bible internally that's problematic. There are very striking contradictions in the New Testament. These are not important, and you don't even hear me speaking speak about them or addressing them. That's not what's wrong with Matthew's claim that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. Of course the Messiah could be born in Bethlehem. King David managed to do that. See 1 Samuel chapter 17. The problem with the Christian Bible, the problem, is it completely contradicts Tanakh. The problem is that Jesus filled nothing in the Hebrew Bible. The problem is that the core doctrines of the church are opposed by the Hebrew Bible. The notion that the Messiah is supposed to die and his death would be a ransom for our sins is opposed by the prophets of Israel. The claim that Matthew makes in chapter 20, verse 28, and, Ma and Mark chapter 10, verse 45, is antithetical to everything that the Bible has to say, that the God of Israel has to say. That's the whole problem with it. The problem is not, if, if Matthew would have remained silent, let's say the book of Matthew didn't exist for a moment, so we only had three Gospels, why, why not? There would have been many, many more Jews that would have joined Christianity. Matthew made it just implausible. Why? Because he misquoted, misappropriated. I'm, I'm trying to be nice here. He lied about what it says in the Hebrew Bible. And no one could believe in a lie unless you don't know enough. The church will accomplish that task not by only, um, only bringing in people who are ignorant, no. They would prevent their parishioners from knowing the truth by denying them the Hebrew language, denying them access to the original text. So the problem with the Christian Bible is it contradicts the Hebrew Bible. Now, if the Christian Bible was not based on the Hebrew Bible as it purports to be, there would be no problem. Then it would be, you can assign it to... Um, the Bhagavad Gita, the scriptures of the Hindu religion, the Pali Canon, the scriptures of the of the Buddhist religion, they're not based on Tanakh. They don't claim to be, and therefore they're just completely removed. But the Christian Bible claims repeatedly that it is a fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. Second Timothy three sixteen. John, if you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. I didn't make that up. Luke 24, 44 through 46. That's how the book ends. But Jesus says that his death and resurrection was foretold in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. It's a lie. So, the reason why the Christian Bible is not the Word of God, it is not inspired by the by the Spirit of Hashem, is not because I don't like the. It's because it's inconsistent with the Torah. It's inconsistent with the prophets. The God of Israel says that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. Deuteronomy twenty four, Ezekiel chapter eighteen. Jeremiah chapter 31. And Christians should know Jeremiah 31. They should know all of this, but they don't. They rely on Christian mistranslations and a scam that's mind-blowing. The church will assemble a, 
a Septuagint claiming that it's the original Septuagint, which was the only the five books of Moses, but rework it, rework it, claim that the New Testament authors were lied on the Septuagint. The Septuagint, which predated Christianity, that's a lie. Septuagint is mentioned nowhere in the New Testament, and it's regurgitated over and over. Professor, professors tell their students this because that's what their teachers taught them. It's not true. So the reason why the Christian Bible is not the word of God, it is not trustworthy, and anyone who believes in it and wants to make him, he wants to make himself right by God, must renounce Christianity in the New Testament is because it contradicts the Hebrew Bible. Now, can this, you say, well, why don't we use, apply the same standards? I get that all the time. And I want to say these two sweethearts. I'm talking my heart. I was I confess I was going to say you haven't thought this through. But I'm not gonna do that's a little strong. Not because it isn't true, it is true. You haven't thought it through, but because it the way Christians are taught, and I believe this person who wrote in the letter said that 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 he or she was a Christian. So the reason why Christians get in trouble, are very vulnerable here, is because of the way Christians are raised. They're taught about Jesus as little boys and little girls sitting at their bedside with their mother, praying to Jesus before they go to bed. So that's the whole thing. Jesus loves you. That's how they go to sleep at night. And then mommy gives you a kiss and whispers in your ear, Jesus loves you. And that has such a calming effect on children. And that's how they go to sleep at night, knowing Jesus loves me and my mommy loves me and my daddy loves me. That's how kids go to sleep at night. And then they can rest peacefully. What happens then is at some stage, they begin to learn about the Hebrew Bible. I don't mean just the record of creation in Genesis or the flood. That they get fairly early. But later on, they learn more of the Hebrew Bible, not too much. But they then read into every story, oh, that's Jesus. That has to be Jesus. That is just a picture of Jesus. So they're reading it. That's why Christians believe this. That's stupid. They're just taught in a way, in a way that's so backward that it, it interferes with their ability to put this all together because it's reversed. What a child should be taught is the Torah. That's how it should begin. The Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And then at some stage, you go, oh, mommy, like, for me, like, why do they, I don't remember the, I, I guess I saw like a church in Brooklyn called Holy Ghost, and I saw them celebrating, like, why are they doing it? And I learned what Christians believe. And immediately I realized that there's, there's nothing remotely resembling this in the, in the Hebrew Bible, that God had a son who died for our sins, and no, no, that's it's alien, you see? Now, there is nothing, so now let's, and people ask me, why don't you use the same standard? I do. I look at the book of Isaiah, and I ask myself, is there anything in the book of Isaiah that contradicts the book of Deuteronomy? The answer is allowed no. There is no new commandment in the book of Isaiah, nothing. And Isaiah is fairly large, 66 chapters. That's more chapters than the book of Genesis. It's a pretty big book. Jeremiah is even larger, although it has fewer chapters, just a very, very large book. So when you look at the Hebrew Bible, we do, that's exactly what we do. We apply the same standard. We say, is there anything in Jeremiah, is there anything in Isaiah that conflicts with the book of Leviticus? Genesis, no, of course not. That's the point. So I, I say to you, the viewer, I don't think I've ever received this question head on on our show. When you ask Rabbi Singer, why don't you apply the same standards to the Old Testament? I do, that's the whole point. When you look at the book of Psalms, there is nothing in there that contradicts the... Um, the book of Exodus. No, that's that's the point. And there are many, many more miracles in the, the whole creations of the heaven and the earth. 
is it packed into the first two chapters of Genesis? I mean, what could be greater than creating something from nothing? Ephes me ayin, ex nilo, and creating the human mind and consciousness in the image of God to this day, in the modern age. With so much science is known. Imagine what we know today about science and compare it to what was known 200 years ago. Mind-blowing, right? 200 years ago, they didn't know what DNA was. They didn't know what, they didn't understand microbiology, none of these things. And still today, science cannot tell you how it began. They could tell you about transitions. They can go from the big bang, big bang forward. They could tell you all about that. They can tell you how it started, but that's the whole point. And they cannot explain the, the, the conscious mind of the human being. We can. And the Torah makes a big, big point of this. This is how it began. And man is created in the image of God. And no other creature is. We're completely binary. We're both made of the adama of the earth, the clay, same stuff your dog is made of. That's why you feel such a bond with him. You feel such a bond with your dog is because I, I get him, but your dog isn't creating the image of God. So that's the whole point. The whole point is that the prophets don't contradict the Torah. So what we do is we apply the exact same standard. Follow? Moreover, I, I get, I'm going to do this. This is the first time I've ever done this, but I'm going to do this now. And that is I'm going to shut off my cell phone. One other point must be made. And that is the nature in which the nation of Israel experience the Torah. It wasn't that Moses just handed us a book and said, here, believe this. That is part of our national consciousness. We are about to celebrate Passover. We experienced it. We were there. It was our great grandparents who were there. Moreover, it shaped our moral consciousness. Throughout the Torah, we are called upon to be kind to the stranger. Why? Because you were strangers once in a land. You were slaves in a foreign land. Be kind. As an example, during World War II, from 1939 to 1945, nearly a half a million Americans died in battle. The whole experience of World War II shaped the moral consciousness of the American. That generation is frequently referred to as America's greatest generation. America is not the same country today as it was before World War II. America looked at evil in the eye. Okay. Our, our consciousness as a nation has been forever transformed because of hundreds of years in slavery. That's part of our national consciousness. No holiday on the Jewish calendar was experienced by a single person, but rather by an entire nation. These are national experiences. And the descendants of the people who experienced it are here today. Myself, a descendant of Aaron, who was there. So therefore, that's the whole point. Apply the same standard as the Christian Bible, why we reject the Christian We do not reject the Christian Bible because God could not have caused a virgin to conceive. Stop thinking that way. And I hear people say that, and it's wrong. That would have been a, a minor miracle. A minor, I mean, to create a woman, that is a major miracle. To cause a, a virgin to conceive, nothing. When you claim that this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 714, you immediately open your hand. And then I know it's a scam. Now I know you're shuffling from the bottom of the deck. Now I know you're playing the Hello? game called hide the ball. So that's the bottom yeah, line. Okay. Go back to the original. So, And that's the point. Apply the same standards. We, re we embrace the Hebrew Bible for exactly the reason we reject the Christian Bible. Thank you for your question.
I don't hear anything, just so you know. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to. Okay, go ahead, Rabbi. Sorry about that. Uh, Caller, go ahead and tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, This is Darla from Fort Worth. Hi, Darla. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Um, Just wanted to say again, thank you to Rabbi Singer. Um, I'm a Baal Teshuva. I I came back uh, out of the church because of, of him and because of you, so... Again, thank you so much for what you do every day. It's it's truly, uh, it's a light it's a light to all of us. So appreciate it. Uh, I'll try and keep my question as concise as possible. Um, in Galatians one and in Acts twenty two and twenty six, Paul's persecution of the Christians is described in detail. It says he got a mandate from the chief priest to go and throw Christians into prison and to death. And <clears throat> that just strikes me as odd. Not only because, as you've already discussed, executions were very rare. But also because, and please correct me if I'm wrong, prison doesn't really seem to be a punishment in Tanakh. Um, and it seems like the Romans actually controlled the, the prison system at that time, since they had to take, the Sanhedrin had to take Jesus to Pilate to do anything with him. And, you know, Rome was releasing Barabbas and everything. So even if, even if Paul was persecuting Christians, wouldn't he have been working for Rome rather than the Jewish people? Um, would just love a little historical context from the rabbi on that because that seemed very contradictory to me. That's funny. That's a good question. Rabbi? That's a very interesting question. Go ahead and hang up now, Tony, for your answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Rabbi, go ahead. So that's a very good question. So my, from my mind, my brain tells me something very clear, and that is that Paul is writing to advance Paul's credentials. And in particular, the chapters you're quoting from, Galatians 1 and 2. The whole point of Galatians 1 and 2, the second most important uh, letter of all of of Paul's letters, is to advance that Paul has credibility. You should believe me and not the other... uh, so-called Christians, so-called followers of Jesus who are preaching a false gospel. And he's going to unload in chapter 3. But first he's got to tell you why he's credible. So Paul's going to, he does it not only here, he does this everywhere. Famously here, famously in Philippians 3. He's all over the place. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. And I'm a hostile witness. I used to persecute Christians. Right? You ask about the was Paul involved in having people put into prison? The, the, A, so let me say this. I don't believe Paul persecuted Christians. I believe that Paul exaggerated that. I believe that Paul is just a very disagreeable person. This is personality. There are some people in history you know if you sat down with it, it, this is a conversation that's not going to go well, right? Take people from the modern age, you know, Freud. I know, I'm not fairly certain, I know that if I sat down to dinner with Freud, it would not go well. He was a nasty bad person, very disagreeable person, just a horrible person as a human being. Conversation would, it would not go well. So, Paul was a very disagreeable person, but the notion that he physically persecuted Christians, don't, don't believe that for a second. Nonsense. I wouldn't talk about the jail part if that was possible. That could have been possible, but Paul couldn't have done it. And who sent him to Damascus? Who would have any authority over Christians in, in Damascus? Well, certainly not the high priest. And if Paul was a Pharisee, why would he be working for a Sadducee? That makes no sense. The empire? No. This is all silly stuff. So I think about this often. Paul is a person who just got along with I mean, think. I mean, let's, let's, let's think about people who Paul should have been deeply indebted to and turned his back on them fiercely, angrily. Barnabas? Barnabas is the guy who introduced Paul to the Jerusalem church. Like he's the, he's the one that John Mark wouldn't travel with him. Paul is, it's very, and it's very obvious that that stuff isn't made up. 
So what is it, because it's so embarrassing, who would invent that? So it's very clear that just Paul has a lot of trouble getting along with people. He mocks the other disciples. He does it here. He does it in 2 Corinthians. He claims that his level of revelation is higher. These are all things that help his case. What's his case? Trust me. Why trust me? Because I have my revelation directly from Jesus Christ. Who is Paul speaking to when he's when he wrote the book of Galatians? He's speaking to not a person, not a single church, but many churches that he established in what is to, in in what is today Turkey, Asia Minor, right? And he's saying to them, I, I, I was there, I did all this stuff for you, I built all this stuff, and I'm me, and you're following a, who bewitched you, you Galatians? Paul's arrogance is moved so high. If you go to Galatians 4, Paul says to his audience, in, he's so angry, he says to them, you know, when I came to you, I was sick. You took care of me. You did, you did, like, what did you do to me? You betrayed me. You, when you first met me, you treated me like I was an angel of God, like I was Jesus Christ himself. I mean, you hear what's screaming there? Such an ego. So Paul exaggerated his persecution of Christians in his former life in order to in order to convey the notion that he's more credible. After all, I used to be on the other side. I used to be I persecuted Christians and look at me now. And therefore, you should trust me. You see what I'm saying? That's what Paul is doing here. Paul is putting down the Jerusalem church. He's saying that other people have received their revelation through men, but I alone received directly from Jesus Christ. Oh, Peter, don't be impressed with him. When I was in Antioch, I told him to his face he's a hypocrite. Uh, the way he behaved in front of uh, Christians and Jews, totally different. Why is, he, why is this public information? Let's say he had a disagreement of falling out with Peter. Like, why... Why is this why is this lush and hard necessary? Because he's trying to say that he has the supreme he is the supreme authority. He has it directly from Christ. So therefore, I didn't say take everything with a grain of salt, take everything with a, a boulder. It's it's totally made up. He would have no authority, put anyone, lock anyone up. People were thrown in prison. That could have been, and Paul himself will be thrown in prison. That's not the issue. The issue is you're telling me you work for the high priest in Jerusalem to persecute Jews or Christians in Damascus? Really? Please tell me, what authority did a high priest in Jerusalem have over naughty people in Damascus? Nothing. The empire? Well, what issue would the empire have? There will be so minor in the issues of the day those real rebellions going on, let alone we have no historian confirming that. So I wouldn't get caught up in that. I would just say it's true that Paul was a highly disagreeable person. He stood by while Stephen was being stoned to death. Really? People stoned? They had, Jews had nothing else to worry about but stoning someone who believed in Jesus. That's all silly. So I, I would, the big, the big problem is that he would have no authority over people practicing the Christian religion in Damascus. That's all very silly. Percy, no. Now, what Paul does frequently, I believe, because we know more about Paul than we do anybody else in the New Testament, because Paul's letters, at least in my view, nine of them are definitely from his hand. There are some scholars who believe there are seven of them that are indisputable. But let's just say nine, and I'll include Colossians and Ephesians as well in them. What we have is the writing of a person. Like Paul's personality just comes out. And that's and and that personality characterizes his writing style. He's highly temperamental. Like if you ever read the book of Hebrews, which 
is Pauline in theology, it reads nothing like that. The book of Hebrews is highly systematic. The writer's not going nuts. He's not blowing a tantrum. None of those things, right? The, the author of Hebrews is not talking about the author of Hebrews. Paul is always talking about Paul. That's what's most important to him. So here's what, what Paul did is he, and, and I'll, I'll show you what we see today. We see, let me actually reverse this. I see this all the time where I knew Christians 40 years ago, and I heard their testimony 40 years ago. It doesn't make a difference who they are. And it was a, a little itty bitty story about why they converted. They didn't use that word. And then I would like hear them tell the same story of her last year. And the whole story has been like expanded and gyrated, you know, as it grew a long beard. This is not anecdotal happened once. I've been doing this a really long time. So all the characters running around today, and I'm not going to name them because it's not about individuals, but all the characters running around today, their stories today are way, way more than they were when they first became Christian, when they first joined Jews for Jesus. I know these guys. It's a totally new story. There's only a, only a little bit of what was originally there. Because over the years, they exaggerate, then they get offerings, and they realize if they include a little bit more and they exaggerate a little bit more, and if they do a little more tongues talking, and they, 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 they become more, and people like them more. And, consider, and then just, just keep expanding the story. You see that. I see that all around. That's what, so moreover, I, today in the Pentecostal church, People just talk like, you know, the Lord laid it on my heart. The Lord laid it on my heart. So today, like, that goes on all over the place. It's like more. What happened with, in the ancient world is people used to talk this way all the time. People didn't understand about neurosis. They didn't say any of that stuff. People just, like, exaggerated. They had a feeling. People have feelings. Remember, in the ancient world, things were very... People didn't understand what was happening around them. People died suddenly. There were earthquakes and and all kinds of natural phenomena. It was raining. Now it's not raining. They didn't understand why. So they people just talked this way. So people, so Paul, all he had to go, he was certainly grumpy about Christians. Mm-hmm, right? And then he, you know, people just say, you know, the Lord spoke to you. You know what the problem with me is? That the only people who know what I'm talking about are my viewers who were formerly Pentecostals, who are in these Pentecostal churches. You know, just the way people talk. Oh, the Lord laid it on my heart that we should have chicken for dinner. But the Lord didn't lay anything on your heart. It just, it just gets into the vernacular and people talk that way. So Paul exaggerated everything. He never persecuted a Christian in his life. Did he have it in for them? Of course, he had it in for everybody. That's just his nature. He just you don't know people. You don't know people like this. Do you know people in personally in your life who are just very disagreeable? And it's like it may be. I have a great family. I really do. So I don't. Have, but there are people that when you have to be around them, it's unpleasant because they behave and say things in a way that that was Paul. That's why he got along with no one. He was in trouble with everyone. And in fact, in all of his epistles, he's essentially arguing with fellow Christians, not with religious Jews like me, not Jews who are not Christians. So that's the point. I mean, you see that his big problem, so therefore, don't get caught up. Was there such a thing as a prison? Was there such a thing? There was such a thing as a prison. That is, should not be of issue to you. The question really is, would the high priest have ever sent Paul to Damascus to persecute Christians? No, that's silly. Is Paul in first, first and second chapter of Galatians advancing his own credibility? Yes. Is he screaming in chapter 4 and 5 and 6? Absolutely. Is he outrageous? For sure. Did he have an ego that was blow? Of course he did. That's the answer to your question. Thank you. Just so you know, I don't hear you.
Right. I don't hear anything. Okay, Rabbi, sorry. Hold on. Alexa, stop. <laughs> stop. All right, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> Those phone lines are just flooded. I apologize for being No, no, it's all good. I just want to make sure. Yes, I don't, sir. Very good. And, yeah. Okay, good I deal. Just, okay, so, uh, Kelly, uh, you're live on the air. What's the question for Rabbi? How are you? I will. So, I do have a question concerning about the Messiah and the Davidic line. So, a lot of Christian missionaries have been making it a strong argument to a lot of the non-Christians that it is impossible for the Jewish people today or the future to even know who the correct Messiah is because we do not have the Davidic scroll anymore that would should tell us the genealogy of the uh, of the king of King David's line so essentially the Jewish people are set up to fail and follow the Antichrist because there had to have been a first coming of the Messiah because the first coming came the first coming of the Messiah happened during the time where the scroll of King David's genealogy existed at the temple okay now that so there's no temple, talk to me sweetheart that, stay that on the phone stay with me stay. The I'm sorry he, he can he can hear you now you can hear me right hello you can hear me yeah, now right you. But did you, yes but did Do you, you hear, hear me my question? okay yes. I want you to stay I with me you. on this and I'd like to walk this through with you. William, yes, sir. keep him on. You got okay. it. So let's just play what if, if we may. What if we have the Davidic scroll with us today? Let's, let's, let's think that through. Okay. The claim is there was a Davidic scroll that's lost. Okay. So what we, it's only an easy way to solve an equation or a conundrum is to just go, what if? So, Let's imagine this together. There was a scroll, okay? And we had it. Are you following me? Yes. Good. So, okay, so what if we had a scroll, and today there are, I presume, hundreds of thousands of people who are descendants of King David, right? I know quite a few people from the house of David. Okay, so we have a scroll, okay? What would, would it be mean? That, I, don't, I don't know. Be, be it out of parchment, right? right? On Valium. How would you prove that, though? That was the question you just so answered. Let, let's, let's, so I want to do this. I okay. want to say we have it and I prove it, okay? Because I want to eliminate those, eliminate that. I want to get to a point. Okay, so we have a scroll. We have all of the sense of King David, okay? On a scroll, okay? What happened? You tell me. Let's think this through. What happens next? Somebody comes forward and goes... I'm the Messiah, and then you go, hold on, buddy, one moment. <clears throat> and then you, just, just so explain to what you would do. You would do what? You would look it up on the scroll? So, you know, it's like people think like you, sh like you show up at a restaurant, a fancy restaurant, and you go, I have a reservation. What does the person who's working the front desk at the restaurant say? says, what's your name? And then they look it up and they say, oh, look at that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And Mrs. Smith, I presume, we have a table waiting for you. I can see your 8 o'clock reservation. Is that what you're saying this is? That like we would just look it up on a, on a scroll? We'd look, check it? Think. That's what Christian missionaries are arguing. I don't yeah. care about them. I want you to think. You need to think this through. And would we need identification? Like he says, my name is Fivel Moshe, going all the way back to King David. Okay, and uh, so and my grandfather's name was Libish, and my great. So what would you do then? Let's say you have a scroll. This is a non-existent scroll. This is all made up. This is all Casper the Friendly Ghost. This is all cartoons. Oh, wow. This is all Marvel comic garbage. But let's say, what I want to do is I want to just go, fine, I'll concede it. There was a scroll that, I don't know what scroll this is, and it was destroyed somehow. And let's say it wasn't destroyed. Like, how would you know that person's now so David? Like, here we are now. Like, how would you know? You understand? It doesn't, it's silly. Yeah. Okay, it's, that's what I want you to do for now. I want you to think, does it say anywhere in the Bible that we're supposed to look it up in some sort of scroll? Is there anywhere in Tanakh that we would look it up. Do you know how many, how many descendants King David has today? 
Like, who would be it? And how would you prove that that's who your grandfather came from? Let me ask you a question, my dear brother. Let me ask you this. Here we are. The nation of Israel returns back to the land of Israel. All the enemies of Israel are defeated. All the nations are speaking in a pure speech. The Beis HaMikdash, the temple, is rebuilt in Yerushalayim. And here is the man. And we say, not so fast. I know there's a world knowledge of God, the ingathering exiles, the temple's built, but I want to see identification. And what ID would he present that he even is on the scroll? Biometrics? What? A passport? What do we, You see how silly this is? The whole. Anyways, so thank you know very the, much for we your know question. The Messiah by the action. Of the, you know, of Messiah Bashiach, Messiah. by what he's going to do. And in fact, it tells us in the text, in, thank you for your question, if we look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, all nations will serve him. That means if there's anybody doubting it, not so fast, that means he can't be Mashiach. The whole point of Mashiach is the whole world will serve him, Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Gosh, if, if Christians knew Daniel 7.14 as well as they knew Daniel 7.13, we might not be in this much trouble, would we? The whole, it's really, it's, it's a good circular thing. Is when the true Messiah comes, everyone knows. Now you ask, how will they know? How will they know? Because the whole world will be changed. Look what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia now. Need I say more? Look what's going on in Syria right now. Need I say more? Look what's going on in Iran right now. Need I say more? America is spending a half a trillion dollars on armaments every year. A half a trillion dollars. A half a trillion dollars. That's the number at least I remember. A half a trillion dollars on armaments with the ships, its fleets, its aircraft carriers. How many aircraft carriers? That means Mashiach's not here. If America should have one aircraft carrier, that means Mashiach hasn't come. My dear brothers and sisters, there are many people, I'm sure they mean well, who, who declare their loyalty to the Bible, but they don't know it. To them, Jesus is Superman. You ever watch Superman? Superman was the one who showed up exactly at the right time looked terrific and knew exactly what to say and do at any given time. That's what you find in the Gospels. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. And I say this to you, I am very happy that pe some people like me. Make no mistake about it. I, I like people who doesn't want to be liked. Don't like me so much. Go back to the original text. Read it for yourself. I always say it to you, Kindle. Halavai, I only wish that you wouldn't need me. I don't want to be needed. I, I really, I'm not saying I'm not happy people like me. To all of you who send me these wonderful messages, we, I, it means the world to me. But in truth, there are times that I say, don't. Like, don't rely on me. Go back to the text. If you read Isaiah, but in context, all of Isaiah, you're not going to believe in any of this stuff. That's all you need to do. You will become a new creation if you read the book of Jeremiah. If you read the five books of Moses, you're not going to believe anything in Christianity. You won't need me. When Mashiach comes, the world will be changed, and everyone will know that he is the king. He is the Davidic king that will speak in the name of Hashem. Everyone will know that. No one's going to say, hold on, buddy, I want to see your identification. That's the whole point. So if anybody claims to be Mashiach and not everyone accepts him, that means he's not Mashiach. No one's going to go, hold, and what, let's say there was a scripture. I want to also teach you how to think. I want, you to, I want to convey to you how you really should think. And that is just always go, what if? If someone says, well, we don't have it, like somehow all the scrolls were destroyed. Really? When? Where? And let's say for a moment, I, you sound like an American fellow, right? So let's say wherever your, wherever state you're from, and they keep the records of your birth, let's say 
the records were all destroyed in some sort of no one in some sort of destruction. The whole thing. Would you then forget who you are and where you're from? Really? And those of you watching me now, you have, you, your grandparents from Ireland. I don't know. Some of you could prove it. Some of you can't. Like, what would happen? So let's say you know that your grandfather came from the Pale Settlement of Russia in the early 20th century. You know it. Like, if, whether documents in Ellis Island are destroyed or not, you know it. This is all silly. It's all garbage in, garbage out. The key is Tanakh. The key is Zechariah 9. I implore you. <laughs> Don't trust me. I mean... I, just look it up, please. Please make sure I'm, I'm, what I'm sharing with you is in context, that I'm not reading anything into the text. And that's also, I wanted you to know this. If something sounds convoluted, it probably is. Why? Because the God of Israel inspired the prophets of Israel with oracles that are for all mankind, not just fancy skulls with fancy IQs and fancy titles. Salvation has to be accessible to anyone. It's so simple. And therefore, if something sounds convoluted, it probably is not of God. Because it's like, like we don't all need caviar or something that's very hard to access, but we really need water, we need you know bread, and we need the basics. And that's really accessible. Look at wheat. Like, it's important. Fresh water, it's important, right? It's out there. Fans, you know, luxuries, not necessarily. So it's very obvious that the plain teachings of God would have to be very simple. Real, why? Because a six-year-old has to know how to read it and go, okay. And is, is, is salvation only a sign for people only with an IQ above 115? How horrible, how terrible convoluted theologies that Christianity teaches. You know, the of hypostatic union doctrine of the Trinity. Like, what? Why would you? No, I'm one. That's it. No more. But that's the answer. When you get the question, so there's a scroll. Let's say we had a scroll. How would someone say, how would someone prove he's stupid? I love you. I'm sorry for throwing a tantrum, but <laughs> I want you all guys to understand. I want you to just to, to teach you how to think. And this is not complicated. All I'm saying is put the Hebrew Bible first. The church says that the Hebrew Bible should be first. Its claim is, it's fantastic, that it is based on the Hebrew Bible. Fantastic doesn't mean bad. It's just, okay, you're making the claim. Let's look it up for ourselves. Thank you for your question. All right, all right. I'm going to move on to the next caller. One second. Make sure I've got the right one. Here we go. All right, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Um, hello, uh, Rabbi Singer. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I'm from Dallas. Uh, my question is about Jeremiah 316. The verse says, In those days, um, the Ark of the Covenant shall not be remembered, nor shall they visit it. So the missionaries are claiming that the Ark of the Covenant will be abolished, thanks, and the Torah will be abolished thanks to Jesus. So is this true? No. What is the function of the Ark of the Covenant? It contains the Jeremiah of, says uh, that it'll be in those days, says the Lord, that Aaron bris Hashem, the Loyala Alev. Doesn't say it will not exist. It says people will not talk about it and people will not it will not come to mind. They won't even think about it. What? All right, so I want you to stay with me. Don't let him go, William. Yes, sir. My sweet brother, what was the the Aron, what was the Ark, what was it used? What was the nation doing when they put the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them? What was going on? Think. Okay. When they went, when the Jewish people went to battle, what went right in front of battle. What 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 was with them in battle? Are you there? He's still okay. with yeah, us. Yeah, I think, I think the, the Ark of the Covenant, right? When yeah. the Jewish people went to battle, right? The descendants of Levi, they had the Ark of the Covenant with them. That was there in battle. God was with them. Yes? Anyways, thank you for your question. I don't want to ask you questions on air. Anyways, thank you, sweetheart. Go ahead. What is a 
key feature of the messianic age. What will happen? There'll be a worldwide knowledge of God, and as a result, war will come to an end. Which means people are not going to have to go, whoa, we need the Ark of the Covenant because there's a battle going on and we need to put it ahead of us. So Jeremiah, how he did it, I don't know. Because this same chapter, Jeremiah is calling the nation to repentance. In this chapter, he's conveying to them that God will forgive you. In these surrounding chapters, God says, you will be like a child. And although a man who divorces his adulterous wife and she takes another cannot take her back, I'll take you back, just come back to me, return to me, and I'll return to you. That's a, that's a refrain that is consistent. But Jeremiah is telling us about Mashiach all over the place. And that what is the future hope? The future hope is that we won't need war any longer. The future hope is that even Jerusalem will be called the Lord of hosts, the Lord of righteousness, a time when the world will speak besuffa brura, a pure speech. And therefore, the what traveled with the nation as they went to battle will come to an end because there will be no more battle. Zechariah 9, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, 3, and 4. It's going to come to an end. All nations will be of one accord. So it doesn't say it won't be. It just says you're not going to be thinking about it. You're not going to be talking about it. You're not going to remember about it. Why? Because you're not, it's all over. You don't need it any longer. It doesn't mean that you'll have the, that you, no one will have to keep the Ten Commandments. I don't even know what's being conveyed. The key is that you won't need that in that time. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. We'll move on to, Rev. I've got two more calls. It looks like we got plenty of time for them. So, all right, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. This is Johnny from Florida. Welcome, Johnny. Hey, and my question for the rabbi is, when did they start going from paternal to maternal on Jewish identity, not tribe identity, but Jewish identity, and why? That's my question. Good question. Okay, um, go ahead and hang up now to you for answer. Thank you. So the the question contains a a a. a you presupposing that it went from one to the other and should have kept you on. And that, that presupposition is not valid. Um, Jewish identity was always conveyed through the mother, not through the father. When did it start? I guess when the Torah was given, because it really is, it's in the Torah. It famously in Deuteronomy chapter 13, I mean, it's just taken for granted that, you know, your mother, if it is the son of your mother, then it's your brother. I mean, look at Deuteronomy 13. Let's just take like the word, like the a nightmare of, of a path. When I say nightmare, it's producing something that's, most painful. You have a brother, a fellow Jew, who is trying to seduce you, right? What does the text say in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 5 and 6? Right? So the Torah says, if your brother, let me find the passage here. If your brother, the son of your mother, comes to you, let me just pull up the text here for one moment so we have it right in front of us. Here it is. Ki yesischa achicha ven imecha. If your brother, who is who? The son of your mother. It is all kinds of other possible family members. But here's one family member that's not mentioned. Because what comes to view as a fellow Jew is ki yesischa achicha ven avicha. Where is ven avicha? It's not there. 
So right there, that means it's not Ochicha, it's not your brother. So that's how early it is. Why? So then the question becomes, why is it matrilineal descent the only thing that can convey Jewishness? So I think the answer that people give who are inclined and who are um, secular is because you always know who someone's mommy is, but you can't be sure what their daddy is. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because the way tribe identity is conveyed is through your father. That's really important. It's really important that if you're a priest, that you know you're a priest. And you know how to know you're a priest. And the Bible tells us, the Mishpachaisim Levesavaisim, in Numbers chapter 1, because there is dealing with tribe. Here in Deuteronomy 13, there's many other examples. In fact, in fact, I won't skip this. There are many examples in Tanakh where you have a child of an intermarriage. And whenever the child has a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, the child's considered a Jew. Like Leviticus chapter 24, you have a woman who's Jewish. She's from the tribe of Dan. And she got hooked up with a Mitzri, an Egyptian. Whatever the deal is, they had a kid. And the kid went on to curse God, right? The kid's Jewish, right? Converse, let me just take another example. Ezra chapter 13, you have there Jewish men. We're told their names. I think it's 113 names. Who came to Eretz Yisrael to rebuild the second temple for the second commonwealth. Among them was Ezra's own nephew, his his. Um, his own, his great nephew, who took a non-Jewish girl, a Goyish girl. And what does it say to them? He said, send away their wives with their children, because the children are not Jewish. If Jewishness could be conveyed through a patrilineal descent, then why send away the kids? The kids are not Jewish. They belong with their mothers. You see it also in Deuteronomy 7. You see it in many, many different ways. So, in Tanakh, we, throughout the corpus of Tanakh, whether we go back 3,300 years ago to the time when the Torah was given, or we go back 2,500 years ago in the time of Ezra, same deal. It's unchanging. We have many examples in Tanakh of an intermarriage. When the child is a product of a Jewish woman, she is the, the child, the offspring, is considered a Jew when it's a Jewish when it's a a Jewish father, the, the offspring is not considered Jew. So it, it goes back. I mean, after all, how do you change something like that? Like it's the word of God. It's supposed to be unchanging, and it is. Thank you for your question. Okay. All right. Uh, color, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, hey, this is Ryan from Houston. Oh, hey, Ryan, what's up? Hey, so I'm currently going through conversion. Um, my grandfather's Jewish, so I'm going through conversion. And I'm getting a lot of um, anti-Talmud talk from Christians. And I have a few quotes here maybe the rabbi could talk about. Okay, give me one. Okay. Um, Ruth Zutra, one twelve reads, Do not trust a convert even to the 24th generation, because the inherent evil... Is still within him. Okay. The context there is what? Uh, these are quotes given to me. Sorry, I, I don't. Uh, right. I don't have the context. So, so here. So all right. So here's. That's what I figured. So, anyways, thank you for your question. Go ahead and hang up now. To all right. Thank you very Thanks. much. You bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'd encourage you to do is to always look up something in context. Is it talking about a ger toshev, someone who is um, a stranger in the land but hasn't fully converted to Judaism? Does the status of a ger toshev, which means someone who lives in the land of Israel, is entitled to protection in the land of Israel, can own land in the land of Israel, at least temporarily, could that be conveyed over to future generations or not? 
so that's why I would encourage you to do. Um, it's unfortunate that the anti uh, Talmudic texts are both coming from uh, anti Semitic sources and sometimes coming from evangelical sources. But always just look up the context. Like, like just look it up for yourself. And one of the things that you have accessible to you today is you can, you, that the, the internet is both a, a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you can watch and study Torah online, but you also could have that kind of material proliferate online. It's a blessing because you can look up the Talmud online, but you can look up all of it online, but you have people who are taking stuff out of context. So that's the deal. And I would always encourage you to just look it up in context. Okay? Thank you for your question. That's great. I personally have heard... I mean, had Christian show me years ago, um, of at least probably half a dozen, maybe more, and every single one of them, every one of them was taken out of context. Right. So definitely don't go to a Christian website looking for your answers. <laughs> so, okay. Call your lab on the air. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Hello? Yes, you're live on the air. Okay. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. So in Matthew 23, when Jesus is pronouncing the 23, I mean, the seven woes, I'm confused, um, well, not really confused, but it seems odd to me that he gets upset at the scribes and Pharisees. He says, well, to you, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make, you know, a single convert, and they could become a convert, I'm assuming that's the meaning of the word, and then you bec become twice as much a child of hell. Why is he upset that people are presumably being converted to the same, you know, uh, religion as he, and then condemning both parties? I'm just a little confused about why Jesus felt that way. Mm, all right, good question. But could you don't don't let her off yet? Okay. Just so my question is, why is Jesus very anti the Pharisees and scribes? I think that's your question. Yeah. Because and they why don't is believe. he against people because, being converted? Right, because the answer is because they don't believe him. And Jesus is hmm. caught, this is what comes into view. The real Jesus? I don't know. But what, what's in view here is that there's a conundrum. And the conundrum is that, on the one hand, everybody, know, everybody knows that the Orthodox Jews, and that's what Pharisees and scribes are, that they are, their knowledge is the gold standard. And they believe in the oral Torah, right? But then why don't they believe in it? And that's what Matthew 23 is addressing. It's going, they're just bad people. Because Jesus can't, and thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. Matthew cannot ascribe the rejection of Christianity by religious Jews to their not being familiar with the text enough. He has to ascribe it to their character. It's something that I wouldn't do is in on here. I wouldn't say they just don't have that information. Like if when I say this is why Christians believe in Christianity, I don't say they're stupid. I know exactly why because they've been deprived information. Right? I earlier on the show I talked about how little girls when they go to bed, right, they pray to Jesus with their mommy, right. Jesus loves you, mommy loves you, daddy loves you, and that's it. And that's what, right? That's why Christians believe in Christianity. It's why it's very hard for them to, to access it. What I never say on air is that, um, is that Christians have bad motives for rejecting Judaism. I I'm, I'm never say that. I'm always ascribing their unbelief in the true God of Israel, to the way they were raised, so that they're not reading the text properly. Well, Christians can't say that about Orthodox Jews, can they? Right? That means what I say about, I, I'm, I'm never explaining the unbelief of the Christian, the lack of faith in the God of Israel of the Christian, to their personality or character. Rather, they're just raised that way. This is what their pastor teaches them. 
And I think very frequently I say to you that it's probably not your pastor's fault because this is what he's been taught, right? Why do I do that? Because I really believe that. I not only believe it, I've been doing this so long, I, I know it. I know exactly why Christians are Christians, and I used to not know. Because what happened to me was, as a youngster, I thought Christians were crazy and stupid. And I just thought whatever negative was, because I grew up, the Christians were insane where I grew up. They were, it was a bad time, and that's all I knew. And they all hated me, and I thought they were all crazy, right? Then I met really nice Christians, like really, really nice Christians. I had to reassess. Okay, they're really nice people. Why, what ha- why do they think this way? And then I, I read their Bible and I go, oh. And then I get to understand how they be, like, how do they come to be Christian? So the point is that I never have to do what the Christian Bible does repeatedly. And that is, I never have to do mind reading. I never, to, never have to ascribe the Christian's rejection of the Jewish faith to bad character. There are missionaries who have pretty bad character out there, and they're making a fortune of doing what they're doing. But I don't talk about that. It's not my style. I never name them. And they do this to me constantly, constantly. And I take it as a compliment. They have to, because they can either say that this is why Toby Singh is wrong, and then and present a lucid explanation for that, or they can just say he's the worst person in the world. Well, the, the latter is much easier. That's what the Christian Bible is doing. The Christian Bible is beginning. Matthew twenty-three is a is a visceral chapter where Jesus, we are told, attacks the character of the Pharisees. Pharisees and scribes, same thing. But he, he can't attribute why they don't believe in Jesus to their lack of knowledge because they sit in the seat of Moses. That's how it begins. He concedes that. In fact, it's very important because that was so the gold standard that if, 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 if you don't claim Pharisaic Judaism as your launching point, then you have no credibility at all. And in fact, in the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew has been saying that you're, the righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees and the scribes in order to have eternal life. Well, why, why not the Sadducees? Because they didn't believe in the oral Torah. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They weren't true believers. The true believer was the Pharisee. Well, then why don't they, why don't they believe in Jesus? Because well, they're, they're, they're the worst people in the world. Sound familiar? This is where missionaries get it from, right? And then Matthew goes on to crazy, crazy, crazy talk later on in the chapter where he says in, that all the Pharisees are responsible or the Jews are responsible, however you want to put it in there, are responsible for all the righteous blood. It means every innocent person ever killed, you guessed it, we are responsible. From Abel, verse 35, that's the first victim of murder, to Zechariah, the son of Barachiah. Not kidding. It's the wrong Zechariah. It should be Zechariah, the son of Yehoyada. Matthew made a mistake. In his, in his tantrum, he made a mistake. Well, actually, this is coming from another source that Luke is also grabbing from. Luke is a little smarter than Matthew, and he corrects that. So it only in Matthew chapter... In Matthew, in in Luke chapter eleven, verse twenty-one, changes this. Eleven fifty-one. Notice there in Luke eleven fifty-one, it's Zechariah, but note the son of Barachiah, because Luke Luke is cleaned up. And then it ends by, "I will not return unless you say, Blessed is the coming Lord." That's why. Matthew 23 is to explain why the Jews don't believe in Jesus. Incidentally, it's not only there, it's a theme throughout. The Jews are just enemies of God, and not because they don't know better. It's because they're evil. They're dark. They're the, sun, they're, they're the seed of the devil. Thank you for your question. 
All right, moving on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yeah, is that me, William? Yes, Bill, you are live on the air. Go right ahead with your question. Yes, hey, William. Hey, Toby. I'm glad to <coughs> talk to you guys again. Hey, my question is, I've just been kind of doing some thinking, and in Revelations in the, in the Christian New Testament, it's talking about where the Antichrist at some point will be set up on a throne, and and he's he's speaking blaspheming uh, against God and everything. And my thought was <clears throat> because I came out of Christianity, and now I'm Noahide, and you know my thought is that there's going to be many Christians that are going to be deceived because they're going to think that when David is actually setting up in the, you know, the, the throne, are they going to be thinking that, that, that that's the Antichrist, you don't bow down to him and everything, you know what I mean, because, because they're still looking for their, their deity to come back and rapture them and, and everything else. And I was just kind of wanting to see what Toby thought on that sure. perspective. Is it going to be kind of like a, Bill that's going to, you know, really slow the people down. I, I know it says that everyone will know that, that uh, he's the one true God. But I got it. I got your question. Bill, thank go ahead and hang up and tune in for your answer. Thank you, sir. All right. You thank bet. you. Um, all right. So for those of you in a rush, so the really short answer is no. They're not going to do that. When the true Mashiach comes, they will all know it. The knowledge of God will cover the walls, the water covers sea. There will be no longer any tension between peoples. Nations will grab the shirt of a Jew and say, take us with you, for now we know God is with you. And notice Zechariah 8.23. Ten of the nations will grab the shirt of a Jew. Why do they have to grab our shirt? They just don't go anywhere. We need to stay with you. You, do you have any idea what we've been through? We've been through Christianity. We've been through all these religions. And now we know, don't ever leave. I know you Jews like to, used to not want to be try to convert anybody. I need you to stop talking to me. I need to find that because I know it's from you. Kishamanu, for we have heard that God is with you. The actual language of the text. So, no, by definition, when the true Mashiach comes, Christians will not reject him. They will all embrace the Jewish faith. For you, the viewer who's watching this, who does not understand the question, I'll now explain it. There is an idea of an Antichrist found in the Christian Bible. The Antichrist is named that in the uh, epistle of John. The Antichrist is spoken of in Second Thessalonians, in the book of Revelation. Uh, and Christians have different views of who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist is Satan, but how is it manifested? Gosh. So Christians have believed a whole bunch of things. Today, many Christians believe, and it was, I don't want to just say this is a modern iteration, but it has been widely believed by Christians that the Antichrist is somebody who claims to be the Messiah and the Jews worship him. You know you know what I'm thinking, right? We're not supposed to worship Mashiach, so it's there. Whoever, whoever wrote the book of Revelation is essentially projecting, like because we don't worship, we serve Mashiach as a king. We don't worship him as divine or anything like that. You see how they're... All right. So, so in this thought uh, is that uh, at the end of the... There's a point where some where someone claims to be the Messiah sits in the throne of the temple and then the Jews worship him and just grab a whole bunch of other people to worship him. And it turns out he's not the Messiah at all. He's actually the... He's actually Satan. He's an imposter. That's the key. So therefore, when the true Mashiach comes, and please God, it'll be soon, won't the Christians then reject him? So no, they won't. But until the true Mashiach comes, they will accuse 
anyone who they think the Jews think is the Messiah of being the Antichrist. And it's happening now. This is not the first time. So th there, are, there are people, Christians claim, who the Jews believe is the Messiah. Okay? I want to repeat that and rephrase it because I don't know if people have said that. Christians claim that there's an individual today who Jews already are worshiping as the Messiah. And that must be the Antichrist. And 99% of the of the stuff out there is that, ah, this is the Antichrist. It's called coming, excuse me, that this is he's the Messiah. It's coming from Christian sources. And they're playing this up. But as it turns out, nobody knows. Now, we can say today, you can say at any time, that person there, he just seems to have the right character and the qualities that we would hope to see in Mashiach, promised us in Mashiach, more importantly, in the first three passages of Isaiah chapter 11. Maybe that's it. So, so the answer is no. The true Mashiach means that all, everyone will know it's really him, and they will not be fooled. This notion of an independent agent of Satan that rules and governs minds, seduces people away from the true God, and who is the tree, chief enemy and blasphemer of God, that is a Christian invention, and it's born out of the dualism that gyrates in Christianity. In the dualism, meaning the notion that there is a a good God, a good creator, and there's a malevolent and evil divine being who's at war with the true God. And that plays out, you said Revelation, surely plays out in Revelation 13. And they're ultimately at war with you. That doesn't exist. That's strictly pagan. If you want to find stuff like that, you can... Zoroastrian traditions, there's where you'll find your dualism in the Persian gods. And it's understandable why people thought that way. They thought that way because think about the ancient world. This bad stuff happened to some people inexplicably and good stuff happened to others and they just didn't understand it, couldn't explain it. They just thought that the world was, uh, they were transcendent beings that were at odds and at war with each other. And that's all pagan. None of it's Jewish. Sutton is nothing more than an angel of God that does the will of God. And his job is to cast forth, cast forth blandishments to mankind so that man has free will and can choose. Thank you for your question. All right, we got one final question we, on board. We do? Yeah, we got about, right. we got about 20, no, I mean, yeah, about 10, 12 minutes left, I guess you could say, for the hour. All right, All right. So, well, okay. Right. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, caller. Time, or should you, I try another time? Nope, you're good. Come on in. You're live on the air. Tell us your name, where you're calling from. Oh. I'm uh, Phil Kelton with, from Ocala, Florida. Welcome, Phil. Hmm. All right, so what happened was I'm an Orthodox Jew. I do Tefillin every morning. <laughs> and I had a preacher try to convert me, which was useless because that would never happen. But one of the two things that he put it to me, which I thought was kind of odd, was uh, something in Matthew about the two greatest commandments that he said Jesus said. And it occurred to me when I went back to read that, that's the same thing that I do with the Tefillin. So the, the question is, I guess, or an observation, how come the Christians don't do that? Because that, cause that's what we're supposed to do with Tefillin, love your fellow man. But anyway, it was just a thought. Your question is, why don't Christians do what? Wear tefillin? Yeah, if, if, if Jesus said to them to love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and the second part was to love your neighbor as yourself, well, that's the same thing that we do with tefillin. Correct? And, and just give me, you're all right, and God bless you, and I didn't know there were that many Orthodox Jews in Oak. In Ocala, um, but there's a, um, there are a few so, of us. <laughs> there are a few of you. So you're asking why don't Christians put on tefillin? Is that what you? Because they would say yeah, it, it, that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself, and they would say we believe in a hero is the Lord. 
Lord is one. They we should love the Lord your God with all heart, soul, and mind. They they'd say we believe that, but I guess so. Let me share this with you. It's because Paul's iteration of Christianity, where ritual commandments are rejected, oh. th- therefore Christians don't observe these commandments any longer. Follow? Does that make sense yeah, to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Paul was, thank you for your question, Paul was fiercely antinomian, which means that he opposed not just law, but ritual law. And there were other Christians at that time, in the first century, who did not agree with Paul at all. And Paul hated them, and they hated Paul. And we have, we don't have any surviving literature of Paul's opponents, because no one copied it, but Paul talks about them constantly, as did the church fathers. Iterations of Christianity that are lost. Ebionites, Nazarenes, just people that, what does believing Jesus have to do with keeping mitzvot? Moreover, we have the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus encourages his followers to keep the commandments and that he didn't come to break anyone, and anyone who would break the least of these of these commandments would be would not have a place in the world to come, right? So what's happening in the Christian Bible is different views of how a Christian should behave and believe is moving through the New Testament, the canon, and they conflict with each other. And it's for this reason that to this day, there are Christian sects that believe that you do have to keep the Sabbath, like the Millerite group, the Seventh-day Adventists, and those who fiercely reject it. And they all are basing their practices on passages in the Christian Bible. So in the very early period of the Christian religion, there was, there was fierce arguments over like, what are people supposed to do? Do you have to convert to Judaism, become circumcised, uh, keep these commandments if you become a Christian? And in fact, this conflict is played out in the book of Acts, where the important, the leaders of the church, we are told by the author of Luke, gather together, and they, on one accord, agree that the the Christians who are formerly non-Jews, or now Christians, that they don't have to keep any of this ritual law. They have to live a, a moral life. Essentially, it's the seven Noahide laws. They can't eat from an animal who's strangled. It's interesting. They can't eat from an animal who's uh, who was sacrificed to the gods. Paul changes that. Good old Paul, First Corinthians eight. He goes, "I don't need to do that." But it's a void desire. It's idolatry. So we can know that there was this conflict in the Christian Bible because it's really embarrassing, and it's very clear that the author of the Book of Acts. We don't know who wrote it, but one thing is certain: he was. He wanted to make sure that it was Paul that won out at the end of the day and that Paul is the good guy, and he's portrayed that way. He's portrayed that way in Second Peter. That's all a pushback against those who said Paul is wrong about everything. And Paul, as I said earlier in the broadcast, is fighting with everyone around him. But here's the key. Paul wins. Now, he is lost with the God of Israel. Paul has led billions of people into idolatry. Paul spiritually was toxic for the world, but he was the person who was most responsible for the spread of Christianity, and he is the proto-Orthodox voice in the church, meaning it is his view of Christianity, and in this, on regards to your question, it is his antinomian view that was adopted by Christians, by the church fathers, by Ignatius. He was so influential that there was a, 
a thinker from Asia Minor who thought that only Paul's understanding of God was correct and it's above everything else, Marcion. He even rejected the Hebrew, the Jewish Bible as inspired by a different lower God. So the key is that Paul's views were adopted and his opponent's views were crushed. That's not to say there were not little groups appearing all over the place that said, well, you have to keep the law. But they were always then considered an outlier, crushed by the church, persecuted by the so-called Orthodox. Um, and we have a lot of information on this. So, right, that's how it, it, it came to be that non-Jews would say, oh, yeah, we believe you have to love the Lord your God. And Christians would say we believe in one God, but they would have to mess with that in the doctrine of the Trinity. Paul won. His opponents lost. Ultimately, because Paul won, billions of Christians lost lost out on a true intimate relationship with the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. James, thank you for your question. Well, that was a great show, Rabbi. Always. I think that's going to wrap us up for today. So thank you all for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Is Willing. Don't forget to check out Rabbi Singer's books. Two-volume book set on screen. The CDs are not available. The audio files are. Go to his website, outreachjudaism.org. <clears throat> Pardon me, outreachjudaism.org, and just look for the free audio tab at the top, and you'll find all the contents of these CDs, which are matching content to the books. This is not an audio book. Don't make a mistake about that. This is uh, different information on the same topic. So if you haven't studied the book with the audio files, you're truly missing out. Rabbi, we'll see you next week, and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you on the other side. Peace, everybody. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa